I say, sir, welcome all our viewers, those who have joined us on YouTube Live in another uh, interesting webinar uh, named as Human Library, where we uh, get an insight, the viewpoint, and the in depth story, life story, life journey of uh, army personnel, defense officers from India. And in this webinar today, we are honored to have with us Major General Baljeet Singh Grewalji, Vishesh Seva Medal, retired Army officer, and also former director Maharaja Ranjit Singh Armed Forces Preparatory Institute in Mohali. Before we uh, uh, invite Sir on the platform to share his life journey, his story with us and inspire our uh, educators and youth those are watching. Uh, let's just uh, see a brief journey of ICSI and what is our vision uh, while organizing all the webinars and what we have done till now and what is the significance of 18th April uh, today? Because uh, we usually start our webinar with the importance or the significance the day has. So 18th April, how it is important, why it is important. Yes, it is important because we have another uh, very, very eminent uh, gentleman from defense services. Those, uh, those who are watching, I must want to say that we will be going to listen to his story that is really inspiring for us. But let's just see what else do we have for in April? So 18th April is celebrated as World Heritage Day. So today is World Heritage Day. And when we talk about heritage, heritage is something which we are, uh, we really should feel proud of. And uh, there are a lot many sites in India and across the world, those have been ded uh, dedicated and designated as heritage. And these are the pride, you can say, these are the values, and these are the resources for every person who is a native of that particular site, that particular country, that particular region, which that those heritage sites belong to. And as we know that every day has a significance, um, and uh, some theme dedicated to that day. So World Heritage Day 2022 theme is heritage and climate to promote conservation, research, and employ sustainable strategies to protect heritage sites. Now, I want to uh, tell you that nowadays, especially uh, during these uh, pandemic times, uh, and earlier also, we are really focusing on sustainability. And, and mind you, that sustainable approach is not just important in the social arena, in the social context, in the social issues, but in our day-to-day -day life also, in, in our regular work also, and in our mindsets also. This is all about mindset. Sustainable approach is all about mindset. So I just want to say you that everything that belongs to us, I believe, is a heritage. And we should protect it. We should regard it. We should take care of it because we have to sustain it for the future also in a very, very best manner. Now, uh, to begin with, let's just start. Uh, I just want to ask all the viewers, those who are listening to us, a simple question. I will. Uh, I want to tell that when we say World Heritage Day, though, UNESCO is associated with it. This is the body called as UNESCO in the world. And that particular body is, uh, is dealing with this heritage sites. So in India, I, I, I will not ask that how many World Heritage sites are there in India. I'll tell you that that is 1440. Uh, that is 40 uh, World Heritage sites in India. And also want to tell that heritage sites are divided into three things. That is cultural heritage sites, natural, natural heritage sites, and mixed heritage sites. So cultural deals with the cultural part and the man-made uh, buildings, monuments, and natural, obviously, uh, the things which are naturally occurring 
uh, like the national parks and other things. And obviously the mountains, the peaks, the rivers, and the sites which are on the premises of these particular uh, rivers and other areas. So which have the natural vegetation that is just for uh, raising our general knowledge. But quickly, I'll ask the question now, if I have to uh, tell you that India has 40 uh, World Heritage Sites, my question is, uh, with the latest update, like we can say we are in, uh, in the first part, first quarter of 2022, you have to tell me till 2021, how many World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage Sites are there in the world? This is a simple question. Please write your answers in the live chat box of ICSI YouTube channel. And if somebody can add into that, like I have told that there are three types of sites, cultural, natural, and mixed. So how many cultural, how many natural, and how many mixed, right? So I'll be waiting for your answer and I'll check and I'll uh, mention the name of the person who first of all gives the answer to this question. Moving ahead, um, we, um, we are a link. Who, what is ICSI? What this organization is all about? Those who have joined for the very first time, that is International Chamber for Service Industry. And we are the link between uh, India and uh, more than 31 million overseas Indians. So we are basically catering to the NRI group and we're proud that uh, the Global Educator Forum is with us and um, we, 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 we are into making a global intellectual uh, pool of uh, educators so that we can collectively make education relevant. And all our webinars are dedicated towards that. And also want to quickly tell that in this human library uh, webinar series, we have conducted a uh, lot many uh, webinars till date and lot many guests have come. Like, uh, we can begin with Lieutenant General KJ Singhji and then Lieutenant General Iqbal Singh uh, Singhaj and Lieutenant General Gursharan Singh Shergilji, uh, General Ved Prakash Malik and Madam Ranjana Malikji, then Colonel PNS Subramaniam Ji, Lieutenant General KM Seth, Major General NP Singh, Again, uh, we are fortunate that he has uh, come for two webinars where he, were, he has introduced us with his uh, Shori Yoda Academy. And last uh, week, we all have listened to Major General I.P. Singh. And I really want to say that the stories directly from these defense officers, uh, I'm, I'm proud that we are fortunate that through these webinars, we are fortunate that we are listening to such inspiring stories. And if we can grab even one sentence or one incidence or one experience from their life, we can change uh, multiple times that thing into our life and we can make our life more inspirational, more joyful and more uh, meaningful to live with. And um, again, this is a web portal where you can go and you can have a look what we are doing, what our plannings are for preparing global educators. And uh, we have uh, created, ICSA has created way back in 1994, this is a vision of our Director General, uh, Major Dr. Gulshan Sharmaji, uh, about the first finishing school network for service industry wherein we cater for all types of skills development when we talk not just hard skill, not just soft skill, but a complete set of life management skills as well. And during pandemic, we are glad that we have not stopped this concept and we have converted our physical is, uh, finishing school into inspiration lab uh, and focusing on youth, educators, skills, empowerment, everything. And when we say uh, making education relevant and inspiration lab, so education should be meaningful. Education should be full of fun and, and should be with music, dance, happiness, curiosity, storytelling, whatnot. It should not be monotonous and it should not be based on theory, theory and the classroom environment only. So making it relevant day-to-day uh, -day life and uh, just stressing on one thing, though there are a lot many things to read about, you can do that, but there's no price tag. 
to mental happiness. And that's what, uh, when we say that education should be relevant. So that relevant education should be like that, that it should bring mental happiness, mental robustness, and a, a stress-free environment for learners to learn. As I've told, we believe in this trio, education skills, MSME, Shiksha, Kaushalta, Udyamita, only then we can contribute towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. And we are proud that we have started this series way back uh, during the start of the lockdown period, the COVID, the pandemic, on 25th March 2020, and we have completed till date 1,541 webinars. So please join us. Uh, watch us all the uh, webinars that you can watch, you want to watch on different topics because uh, we, 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 we are uh, in the pledge that this education, when we talk about making education relevant, this is a, such a large umbrella which have different aspects into it. We have um, um, webinars on social issues. We have webinars on education, educators, um, inspirational sessions, all of that. You can go to ICSI YouTube channel and you can view that. And with that, do like, share, and subscribe our channel. Whatsoever human mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Whatsoever your mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. This is not just a quote. This is a truth and imbibe it into yourself and you will see the change will happen in, in your life. Whatever you think, it will start happening. But mind you, think positive, think for the betterment of yourself and for the society. So let's come together making education and skills relevant. And with this, I just want to, because uh, I am no one, to um, say anything about Sir Major General Baljeet Singh Ji, but still I have uh, uh, taken few of the things to introduce Sir in front of all of you. So I'm just reciting whatever I have written here. Major General Baljeet Singh Reval Ji is commissioned into the famous cavalry regiment Hudson Horse. He commanded his regiment Hudson Horse from 1992 to 1994. Later, he also commanded an independent armored brigade in the desert during the Operation Parakram, an armored division. He has held various prestigious staff and instructional appointments during his military career. Prior to retirement in June 2010, he was posted as Deputy Commandant and Chief Instructor at National Defense Academy. For his distinguished services, he was awarded the Vishisht Seva Medal in January 2010. He has also been awarded the Army Commander's Commission card twice. He was the director of Maharaja Ranjit Singh Armed Forces Preparatory Institute from uh, 2010 to October 21. This institute has been set up by Punjab government for, for training young boys to join NDA. And uh, to uh, know more about him, uh, he is fond of cycling, swimming, golfing, and gardening. He also delivers lecture on memory, isometrics, speed reading, leadership, communication skills at various army and civil schools and institutes. Wow, so put your hands together and join me in welcoming Major General Baljeet Singh Grewalji uh, Vishesh Seva Medal in front of us. Sir, we are honored to have you with us and welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Madam Chitra. Uh, it's very, very kind of you. Um, I'd like to thank the International Chamber for Service Industry for inviting me to take part in this human library program. I find that uh, this is a very, very interesting concept and I must compliment the organizers on uh, having conceived this and put it together. I must confess, however, that I personally am a little surprised that I've been asked to speak at such a forum because uh, believe me, I'm just a simple soldier and I have uh, no great achievements to boast about. Uh, all I can say is that I've served with sincerity, worked hard, 
and try to achieve my goals. So it's a great honor. Thank you very much. I uh, noticed from uh, the uh, preliminary talk which uh, Madam Chitra has given that uh, ICS, ICSI focuses on all round development in education. I think that is so wonderful because uh, education is not just what is taught in classrooms. All round development, personality development, skill development, these should actually be the focus areas of education. So thank you very much for this invite. And with those few words, I'll get on to my, uh, the subject of my talk proper. Now, I've been told to speak about my life story. And I think that's not an easy task. Because what do you talk about? Nobody wants to listen to um, just rambling on. So I've tried to be selective. And in being selective uh, in uh, narrating my life story, I would rather talk about the mistakes I've made. I would rather talk about the experiences that I have had. Instead of, you know, just saying I did this and I did that, I'm not an eye specialist to do many things. So uh, I'm going to focus on mistakes because I think there are more lessons to be learned from mistakes and experiences. In life, there are trials and tribulations. Nothing is um, success, success, success. There are setbacks. And how we cope with those setbacks and how we rise to the challenge is what differentiates a winner from a loser. You know, when I was uh, the deputy commandant in NDA, it was my privilege to address the passing out course at the deputy commandant's rehearsal passing out parade. And invariably, instead of congratulating the cadets on passing out, I used to tell them how to cope with setbacks. That is more important than good wishes for the future. Good wishes for the future is fine, but coping with setbacks is very important. I assure you that in my life, I've had several setbacks and I've tried to cope with them. So we'll talk about that. That's going to be part one of my talk. And in part two, I'll give you a roadmap what I think should be a good philosophy for life. Now, you know, you may wonder, uh, he's going to preach to us and give us a list of points. No, I'm, I, I have no intention of doing that. Uh, while giving us a roadmap, I would rather narrate some stories and anecdotes, which will illustrate the point I'm trying to make, rather than to just tell you, do this, do that. That doesn't serve a purpose. So uh, let's get on with part one which is the story of my life. And let's start at the very beginning. I was born um, in a military family. My father was uh, commissioned in the army in November, 1947. And uh, he was a captain when I was born. He was posted in a place called Ahmednagar. Ahmednagar is in Maharashtra. It's the Armored Corps Center in school. My father was serving in uh, the Armored Corps Center in school because he was an Armored Corps officer. He was commissioned in Hodson's Horse, uh, which is the regiment which I eventually joined. My father was a very strict disciplinarian, soft-spoken, but firm, very, very conscientious about his duties. My mother was an extremely hardworking person. She was a lady with tremendous foresight and vision, and she was actually the pillar of the family. My father were four brothers. All four were army officers. Uh, I uh, have uh, a brother. He's also in the army. I have two sisters. Both are married in the army. So I think if you take out our blood, you'll find olive green blood coming out instead of red blood. Completely foggy family. So what was the environment in which we grew up as children? Well, the first thing was the hazard of being an army officer's child is that you change schools very often because one posting to another. So we kept changing schools. And then um, in 1963, we came to Patiala and uh, I got admitted in Yadavendra Public School, Patiala. And then I didn't change schools after that. I carried on in YPS till my class 10. In those days, we used to go to NDA after class 10. When we were children, 
we were encouraged to read. Reading was a passion. We used to read at the dining table. We used to read when walking from one place to another. We used to read and read and read. What did we read? We read comics. We read um, Enid Blyton. We read Biggles. All kinds of books. Every conceivable kind of children's book we read. We were very fond of reading. The central library in Patala was about four kilometers from home. And all four of us children used to walk from home to the central library, draw books and come back. So reading was a great passion. And I think it was a great habit which our parents gave us. My father always insisted that at home, no matter what, we must speak in English. And um, especially at the dining table, we had to speak in English. So all those habits which the parents gave us, they stood us in great stead later in life. Our parents used to spend quality time with us. Those were wonderful days when technology had not invaded the privacy of the family. And uh, the family would sit together and talk about things and stories used to be told and mom used to tell us stories and we used to look at the stars and dad used to explain to us uh, what the constellations were. So those were wonderful days. Um, as children, we, um, we were very affectionate towards our parents. Um, on my father's birthday, we used to organize a little uh, drama, a little skit and a little variety entertainment show, the four of us. So it was good fun being a child. I remember when I was a youngster in school in YPS, um, you know, I got picked up uh, for uh, giving a talk on All India Radio. It's some subject, I don't recall what that subject was. And we were glued to the, uh, to the radio receiver uh, when the talk was on so that we could hear the recorded version of that uh, thing. Cricket commentary was a craze. We used to listen to cricket commentary. We had old Philips uh, radio and uh, we used to listen to cricket commentary. So those were the kind of uh, things we did as children. And um, YPS, great school, wonderful school. I was in YPS. Uh, from 1963 to 1967, after which I went away to India. Uh, YPS believed in all-round development. Um, every sports facility was there, and all of us had to play all games. Whether we played them well or badly didn't matter. I was a very average sportsman, but we used to take part in all sports. Cricket, great passion. We could play cricket from morning to evening. Swimming, we were very fond of. We had a very nice swimming pool just next to the school, an army pool, and we used to swim there. I was quite good in um, academics. And, uh, you know, in those days, being good meant if you get 60% and above, you were brilliant. So I used to try and get into that bracket. And um, uh, favorite subjects, uh, physics and maths, English, of course. And uh, subjects I didn't like, uh, I didn't like biology. I didn't like chemistry. We used to take part in a lot of debates and dramatics. Our teachers were wonderful people, very inspiring people. They used to lead by example. They used to coach us, not just inside the classroom, but outside class hours. So um, uh, they used to train us for these debates and dramatics. We took part in plays like St. John, George Bernard Shaw, and Macbeth, Julius Caesar. So we took part in those debates and um, uh, dramatics. And um, every now and then, there used to be inter-house debate. And I and my brother were both uh, regular speakers then. I told you about teachers in YPS, wonderful people, very inspiring people. Our principal was a gentleman called Colonel F. Vaughan Goldstein. He was a great disciplinarian, no nonsense from anybody, and a very impressive uh, personality. I must tell you that... Um, when I decided to join NDA, and um, by luck, I was able to clear the NDA entrance exam, uh, Colonel Goldstein sent for my father. My father was then a major, and he was posted in Patella. So he said, I want to meet your father. So I was a little worried as to why he wanted to meet my father. And Colonel Goldstein told my father, this boy will not go to NDA. Uh, he should be um, trying for civil services or something like that. So my father asked me, well, what do you want to do? I said, no, I definitely want to go to India. So Ken Goldstein was a little annoyed with me for that. But anyway, we parted on very happy terms. 
and uh, I left school in 1967 after finishing class 10. Now, a very good question here would be, why did I want to join the armed forces? Firstly, well, uh, ever since I can remember, I knew I saw only the military all around. My dad was in the army. My uncles were all in the army. So uh, army was a way of life with us. But what really clinched the whole thing for me, what was the most decisive factor was that the 1965 war had broken out and we were youngsters studying in school and my father took part in the 1965 war. <clears throat> and uh, he was um, fighting in an area called Khemkaran sector uh, in Punjab. And there was a very big tank battle there. Uh, the tank battle which resulted in the creation of what is known as the Patton Graveyard. Patton tanks were Pakistani tanks and a lot of Patton tanks were knocked out by the Indians in a village called Asal Uttar. And uh, soon after the war, the war finished in September 1965, I think in the month of October or November, uh, families were taken up to see the Patton Graveyard. And that was a very inspiring moment for us to see all those Pakistani tanks row upon row lying there with their guns torn apart. Uh, we picked up some mementos from there. I still have those mementos. I've got a driver IR searchlight of a patent tank still with me. So uh, that clinched it. And I remember uh, seeing my father in an open Jeep and taking us around and all. And I thought, this is the career for me. So that is what really clinched it. And uh, after that, there was no looking back. Um, I appeared for the ND exam and um, SSB. I was lucky to clear that. And uh, off I went to NDA after class 10. Three years in NDA. One year at the Indian Military Academy. Very tough routine. We were youngsters. I was barely 15 and a half when I went to NDA. And at 19 and a half, I was commissioned. So at 19 and a half, I had become an officer after passing out from the Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. Now, we were supposed to actually pass out. The parade was to be held in December 1971. But at that time, war clouds were on the horizon. And the passing out parade was pre-pawned. And uh, our passing out parade was held on 14th November 1971, when we got our commission. So I became a second lieutenant. Uh, we used to have one star in the shoulder at that time. This rank of second lieutenant doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I had uh, one star on my shoulder and HH. HH stands for Hodson's Horse. That's the regiment I wanted to join. A great pride. I, I, I don't know whether I felt more pride in the star or in HH. Because uh, we used to think of uh, HH as a great status symbol, you know, his highness like. So uh, it was a great, it was a thrill. It was a dream come true. And uh, I remember that uh, night very, very clearly, even today, when my parents were there for our pipping ceremony, it was wonderful. So we got our commission. But uh, Armored Corps officers have to know the tank. So we sent, were sent off to the Armored Corps Central School, Ahmednagar for doing our young officers course. And I happened to do well on that course. After that uh, course, I joined my regiment in Pakistani area in February, 1972. I was a troop leader. Uh, a troop has three tanks and 14 men. So that was my command, 14 men and three tanks. The tanks with us at that time were the Centurion tanks. What a marvelous tank it was, 52 tons a 20 pounder gun, crew of four, solid steel. It could take a beating. It had done brilliantly well in the war. We took great pride in our equipment. We knew our equipment inside out. There was nothing with the tank that we could not do. Take it apart, put it together, repair it, maintain it, look after the tanks. We, we used to love our tanks. And it was great pride to wear uh, overalls and greasy hands and uh, get into the muck of a tank. Uh, my own tank as a troop leader in Fort Troop Bravo Squadron was KX389. That was the number. And why I'm telling you this is that such was our passion for our equipment that after the, uh, my troop leader days, 
every conveyance that I've had, scooter, motorcycle, car, whatever, has had to have this number 389 on it. That was the kind of love we had with the time. Men, we knew our men inside out. We maintained little troop leader diaries in which everything about the man was maintained. Even today, I can tell you the personal number of my Sahayak, my uh, helper, uh, who was looking after me. So, you know, we used to go into great detail. It was a wonderful days. And I was all by myself in a village in Pakistani occupied territory, a village called Sunyari Kot. This is near a village called Chakra in Pakistan, Shakargarh sector. And um, we used to be all by ourselves, doing our own training, doing our own thing, routine. You know, if you leave a person alone and let him get on with the job, he will perform better. That was the lesson I learned. If you supervise and over-supervise, a man doesn't perform. We were left alone. We used to do our own thing and we worked very hard. We carried out extensive uh, ground familiarization in the area. And on one of those uh, reconnaissances, I met a Pakistani JCO, right, tall, handsome man. And uh, he said, um, Saab, a request here. So I said, yes. And uh, he said, you know, you all are looking after this area. And uh, in, in a particular village, uh, I've got a house. And can you please ensure that that house is looked after? So I gave him my word and we ensured that that house was looked after. I want to tell you that uh, the Indian Army had amazing principles. Uh, all the masjids in the area were untouched. We used to look after them and they were whitewashed before we handed over the area. They were looked after. So there was no, uh, you know, uh, wanton destruction as it happens in war. One lesson I learned at that time was that in war, very often, on a, I won't say very often, but sometimes, the very deserving people don't get decorations. And often, it is the opinion of the juniors which carries more weight about you. So in the regiment, I found that the men knew exactly what the worth of a leader was. I always believe that being a leader is like being a goldfish in a bowl. You put a goldfish in a bowl or water, that goldfish is seen all around, it can hide nothing. Similarly, as a leader in the armed forces, you are a goldfish in a bowl and the men know you inside out. You can't fool them. You have to be genuine. You have to be a genuine good commander if you want to earn the respect of your men. I'm sorry, that pertains more to the armed forces and I realize that I'm speaking to a non-armed forces audience also, but that is the essence of leadership, in my opinion. Okay, now uh, then uh, let's take a jump from 1972 to 1973 when something uh, very drastic happened. On the 28th of May, 1973, I was barely 22 years old when um, I was traveling in a Jeep from Jammu to Pathan Court. And um, the Jeep met with a terrible accident. And I got very severe injuries on my leg. My uh, ankle was fractured. And I was evacuated to Delhi uh, Hospital. And in the army hospital there, I was operated upon on the 6th of June, 1973. After that, for six to seven months, I was laid up. It was a terrible time for me. 22 years old, had had this accident. The doctors said, you should leave the army. You have no future in the army. I couldn't, um, I couldn't conceive of leaving the army. I was in love with my regiment. I was in love with my men, with my tanks. I said, there's no way I'm going to leave. So doctors told me, you will not get promoted. You will have problems. I said, it doesn't matter. That's my aim. I'm going to serve and I'm going to stay in the regiment. It was a very hard decision. I took it. I stuck to it. I've never, never regretted it. But what did I do? Uh, you see, when I was in hospital for six to seven months, I said I must make use of my time. So two very wonderful things happened to me at that time. 
I came across a system known as memory isometrics. Memory isometrics is a technique by which you can make learning simple and easy. You can comprehend anything quite easy. The second good thing that happened to me was that I came across uh, a technique called speed reading. Read faster, read better. And when I was in hospital, I was laid up and doctors were telling me, leave the army. I said, I'm going to stay. Simultaneously, I did memory isometrics and speed reading. I worked upon it. I worked upon it. And I was able to develop my memory skills quite quite well, I think. And I was able to improve my reading skills. These two things which I did in the hospital, they served me beautifully later in life. And uh, I have benefited a lot from it. So, you know, when you're faced with uh, with a down situation, there are two ways of reacting to it. One is to give up and curse life and take the easy way out. And the other is to fight back. I decided to fight back and I'm glad I did because I've never regretted my decision. So I finally, after about seven months in hospital, I came out of hospital. I was in a wheelchair initially, then on crutches, then on a walking stick for a while. And finally, the walking stick was given away and I used to walk with a limp. And then I worked harder and strengthened my leg and I reduced the limp with which I walked. Tough journey, but it had to be done. In order to strengthen my legs, I took to cycling. And after that, uh, I've been a very keen cyclist all along. And uh, I took to swimming and I took to riding, all the kinds of uh, things which don't require you to put weight on the ankle. That uh, is an experience I thought I would share with you. Well, uh, there were several professional courses and with God's grace, I was able to do well on these courses. and. Um, Eventually, I became a major in the regiment, and my regiment was then in Firozpur, which is near the border. Very interesting to know. I told you that as a troop leader, you have three tanks and 14 men. As a squadron commander, uh, which I was in my regiment, we had 15 tanks, and we had about 100 plus men under me. And that was a very, very interesting period. In the meanwhile, we changed over from Centurion tanks and we had Indian indigenous tanks known as the Vijanta. There are two incidents I want to narrate um, about my days as a squadron commander, which I think uh, have some lessons. We were doing an exercise. And in this exercise, um, the tanks were required to cross an obstacle. And our CEO was a wonderful soldier, a great man. He had fought in the 65 war. He fought in the 71 war. He's a tough soldier. So he gave us the task. He said, um, identify places on this obstacle where tanks can cross. And I want to come and see the tanks crossing this obstacle at night. So we said, all right. And we did our reconnaissance. And after great painstaking reconnaissance, we identified one spot on the obstacle where we thought the tanks can get across. So the CO comes at night, about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, pitch dark night. And he says, okay, chaps, we're going to see this crossing. Where are you crossing from? So we told him, so this is the spot. This is the only place where the tanks can cross this obstacle. He said, rubbish. Give me a China graph pencil. China graph pencil is used to mark the map. And he picked up the map and Without looking at it, he just put an X on the obstacle at any one point. And he said, this is where you would cross it from. We were aghast. Sir, it can't be done. He said, this is where you want to cross it from. All 45 tanks of the regiment were lined up, put through, all 45 got across. What was the lesson there? You have to know your capabilities. We didn't. We thought we knew, we didn't. Our CEO knew better than us. So experience is a great teacher. And we learned a lot from that experience. There's another case I want to tell you about uh, when I was a squadron commander. And this was an unfortunate case. It could have gone bad, could have gone very bad. Uh, OK, what happened was that um, our head clerk, 
um, who was a very competent head clerk, he got caught, believe it or not, in a case of espionage, very serious matter, and an inquiry was held. And we were all worried that heads will roll. The commanding officer who had handed over charge of the regiment to the next incumbent was called back to explain to the inquiry how this case has occurred. And I remember an evening in the mess with him, officer's mess, and he said, you know, uh, Seo's shoulders should not droop downwards, they should droop upward. So I said, I'm sorry, I've not understood that. He said, anything that falls on your shoulders, you should take on your shoulders. You shouldn't let it go down below on your men. And he took the complete blame for the incident. It was a classic case of good leadership. The CEO paid the price. He didn't get promoted, but he made sure that nobody down below him was harmed. I think uh, the army brings out such good leadership lessons and one has seen so many good leaders and commanders. It's very, very humbling to have served with them. Okay, my next uh, experience, which I want to share with you was when I was posted in Udampur. I was the assistant military secretary to the army commander in Udampur. And uh, this was 1989 when militancy uh, had greatly increased. This um, incident of the kidnapping of um, Ms. Rubaiya Sayyid had taken place and people were coming out in the streets in uh, Srinagar shouting Azadi, Azadi, and truckloads of people were going across. It was a bad time. And I remember going with the army commander to Srinagar and we saw these horrible scenes and what a cool, composed man the army commander was. Never got perturbed about anything. Fully in grasp of the situation. To see such people operate under these difficult uh, circumstances is itself great education. Well, I was... Uh, the nature of my job was that I was dealing with the officers' uh, matters. And uh, one of the matters we used to deal was postings and so on. And the other main part of my uh, charter of duties was that I was looking after complaints. I want to narrate a small incident here, uh, which I think again has a message. I used to take all the complaints in a box and tackle them on Sunday, because then I had a completely uncluttered mind. And uh, I picked up a complaint file, I tackled it, I made out my recommendations on it saying that the complaint should be rejected. And I put the file away and I said, another file disposed of. And soon after I said another file disposed of, I said, no, hold it. That's not a file. That's a human being. His dreams, ambitions, goals are in that. Look at it with empathy. So I picked up that file. I re-examined that file and I found there was so much merit in what the officer was trying to say. It was an eye-opener for me. Very often, the, what is the message here? Very often when we are doing our duty, we look at ticket punching. Finish this, finish this, finish this. No, ticket punching is not the aim. You have to look at human problems with a human mind. So that was a very fortunate, uh, fortunate time for me. I was able to uh, see the entire area of JNK and um, went to the CHN Glacier and um, that wonderful time came to an end when the army commander was to retire and I remember that when we were seeing him off at the airfield, I asked him, I said, sir, you are retiring today after 40 years of service. What does it feel like to take off this uniform after 40 years? And he said, you know, it's like peeling my skin off me. That's the kind of love we had for our uniform. That's the kind of love we had for the army. So um, that was a wonderful uh, two years for me in Udampur. Well, better things were in store. I was very, very lucky uh, to get command of um, Hodgson's Horse, my regiment uh, from 92 to 94. Two years, easily, easily the best time of my life. There was just one focus during that period, just one. And what was that? 
my regiment will be the best regiment and you know it's not difficult at all you have to make up your mind this is my goal you have to plan for it and when i say plan for it you must show foresight whatever goal you set for yourself please show foresight if you're going to suddenly come across a problem and say how do i tackle it you will not be able to tackle it but if you are anticipating problems before they come you can tackle anything that was a wonderful time of life i have great memories of that time uh, let me narrate to you one small incident which happened to show you how wonderful our men are uh, our prakshak was on there was uh, there were incidents in punjab and my regiment was called out and we went to uh, do a cordon search operation in a village and when the cordon was laid i and my party were to enter the village to check these terrorists who were operating there and i thought as the co as the commanding officer i should be up front so i was leading and suddenly from behind um, an nco non commissioned officer comes he pushes me and comes in front of me his name was dafadar balbir singh he was a command level boxer very wonderful man i was very fond of him so i told balbir i said what are you doing he said sir you will not walk in front i will walk in front i said why he says so that the first bullet doesn't hit the co it hits me i said don't be a idiot and then you know we had this friendly uh, shoulder pushing bout to make sure that i am in front or he is in front finally we agreed to walk in step the men are great they will do anything for you well i told you i had a weak leg and doctors had told me leave the army and i had said no i will not so challenges came up and uh, we have tests known as physical proficiency tests where we are supposed to run i used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning when it was pitch dark and go and practice my run because i couldn't run well initially my leg was weak and then i strengthened my leg so that on the day of the ppt i was able to clear it you have to wear there is just no shortcut about it the journey in the army carried on i uh, had another tenure in jnk where we had a lot of firing incidents at the, on the line of control and um, very fascinating very challenging period uh, in baramula uh, that is when the kargil war had just broken out um after that i was very lucky to get command of a independent armor brigade in the desert four independent armor brigade it was a great honor and it's a wonderful time professionally i think that was a beautiful time but personally it was a very difficult time for me because uh, during that period i lost my mother uh, that is um, in december 2000 and i lost my father 3 months later so the loss of both the parents um, was a very big blow to us to the entire family but we had to overcome it and soon after the cremation of my father i went back to the operational area because my brigade was operationally deployed in uh, rajasthan and um, there was no two ways about it we had to make those uh, sacrifices i had some very interesting tenures after that um, but um, i commanded an armored division in hisar that was a beautiful very challenging period and then uh, my last posting I, i see we are running short of time my last posting was in the deputy commandant and chief instructor in nda and uh, this was a beautiful time because we were dealing with young cadets and their training and uh, we had a leadership seminar on the occasion of the diamond jubilee celebrations and i remember listening to dr apj abdul kalam um, he was uh, not the president at that time at that time uh, shrimati pratibha patil was the president but dr kalam had been called as a speaker such a wonderful speech he gave wonderful not from the point of view of uh, you know uh, i mean you all know that dr kalam did not speak queen's english but he spoke from the heart he was such a genuine human being and i think the great lesson i learned from his speech was that to put across your point of view you have to speak from the heart it must come from here if it comes from the heart you will put across your point of view very well so um 
I retired thereafter on uh, the 30th of June, 2010. A very traumatic uh, experience, very, very traumatic. I didn't want to retire. I wanted to carry on working. It was a very sad day uh, to retire. And uh, I remember when I took off my uniform, you know, it was very hot. Um, and uh, June is a very hot month. And um, I, there was a lot of sweat marks on it. And uh, my wife, she understood my sentiments. And she folded that uniform and put it in a bag. Believe it or not, for uh, 10 years, I didn't have the courage to open that bag. That was the kind of emotional bond we had with the uniform. And uh, I only opened that bag last year uh, because there was an event in my regiment for which I decided that as a retired officer, I will attend in uniform. It was a great time in the army, had uh, the most amazing experiences, served the entire Western border, complete JNK, uh, Punjab, Rajasthan, we knew the ground like the back of our hands. I did not serve in the East, being an Armored Corps officer. But it was a great career, and I have very fond memories of the Army. So when I retired in uh, June 10, I was wondering, what am I going to do with myself? And, you know, when God uh, closes one door, another door is open for you. Nothing to worry about. Another door comes up. And what was the other door? The other door was Maharaja Ranjit Singh Armed Forces Preparatory Institute. This institute was being newly created by the Punjab government in a place called Mohali, which is near Chandigarh. And the concept here was that we would pick up about 48 boys every year who had completed class 10. There was a selection procedure outlined for that. And the boys would stay with us in a hostel for class 11 and 12, and we would prepare them for the NDA, and then they would hopefully go on to join the NDA. Why was this necessary? This was necessary because the contribution of Punjab to the armed forces had been gradually going down. And the then Chief Minister, Sadar Prakash Singh Badal, wanted to restore the old paradigm of Punjab as the sword arm of India. The chief minister, uh, Sadar Badal, was a very, very, not was, is a very, very inspiring and charismatic leader. The only thing he used to tell me, whenever I used to meet him, was make it world class, make it work. He never, ever said no to us for anything. And um, I worked very hard. I, I don't think I've worked so hard in my army career as I worked when the AFPI was being set up in Mahali. You know, the formative years of an institute are always very challenging and difficult. So we worked very hard. And um, with God's grace, results were good. We had a very good team of officers. Uh, without a team, you can achieve nothing. My contribution is just directional. The execution is done by the team, wonderful team. The boys were so good, so motivated, so keen to perform. So with such a team and with such boys, there was no reason why we would not succeed. We had some very good successes. And um, many of the states in India sent their teams to study our model because they wanted to copy and emulate our model in their own states. Niti Ayog sent a team to study our model. And in Punjab itself, a number of institutes sprung up thereafter, copying our model. So, you know, they say flattery is, uh, imitation is the best form of flattery. And we felt very happy about that. I take uh, great satisfaction from what we were able to achieve. Um, many of my boys who are now officers, they're in touch with me and they come and visit uh, me uh, occasionally. I get very funny telephone calls from them. One day I get a call from one of my officers who was 
doing a course somewhere. And he said, sir, many years ago when I was a cadet in AFPI, you had done a lecture on so-and-so subject. Can you send me the presentation? I said, why do you want it? And he said, sir, I have to give a talk on the same subject tomorrow. So it is a great bond. And uh, I served in AFPI for 11 years. And uh, finally, in October last year, I decided to quit. I think 11 years has been a wonderful um, opportunity for me to serve the youth of Punjab. And I still am in touch with the FBI, and I hope they will continue. And not hope, I'm very confident that they will continue to do well. In fact, excel and um, go many steps beyond where I was able to take them. That uh, brings me up to date to the present. And uh, now I'll switch over to part two of the talk, life lessons. So I'm going to keep this brief because, you know, I'm aware that nobody wants uh, long drawn out preaching lectures. What are the lessons I've learned in life? Firstly, competence. There is just no shortcut. You have to be good at your job, whatever that job may be. If you're a doctor, you should be the best doctor. If you're a lawyer, you should be the best lawyer. If you're a teacher, you should be the best teacher. If you're a military person, you should be the best military person. How do you do that? Work. There is no shortcut to success. You have to work. And in today's environment, you have to be technologically savvy if you want to keep pace with what is happening. So competence, there is just no shortcut. You can't bluff your way through in life. The second thing is importance of communication skills. When I look back in life, I find that the greatest thing I picked up from my school was communication because I used to take part in debates and dramatics and so on. You can be a very intelligent person, but if you can't put across your point of view and convince other people of the righteousness of what you're saying, it's of little use. So communication skills are important. Everybody is not born with the ability to speak. Develop it. Abraham Lincoln, one of the most famous presidents of the United States, he was not a born good speaker. He used to practice speaking in an apple orchard standing on a soapbox. So if you practice your communication skills, you can excel. Third lesson. Very important. One word, attitude. Attitude determines everything. There is a situation. Your attitude to that situation will determine the goal. If you have a positive attitude, you will get a positive goal. If you have a negative attitude, you will have a negative goal. You know, one of my favorite uh, quotations is this. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you are right. I'll say that again. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you are right. You can't. Right attitude. I can do. It is possible. No negative thoughts. Let me give you a small story. I don't want to make this boring for you. Imagine a room, a room full of mirrors, right? And there's a little puppy dog, which has just been kicked by somebody. So the puppy dog's ears are drooping and his tail is between the legs and he enters this room of mirrors. What does he see in the mirrors? He sees little puppy dogs all with ears drooping and tail tucked between the legs. And he says, this is a very sad room. I'm not going to be here. And he goes out. Another puppy dog just got a bone. Enters the room, sees all the puppy dogs having bones, smiling, cheerful, ears erect, tails wagging. What has changed? Attitude. One puppy dog, negative attitude gets negative results. Another puppy dog, positive attitude gets positive results. Approach life with positivity. Too often, too often we sit around 
with cynicism. We are cynical. This is wrong. That is wrong. Nobody is right. Corruption is rampant. You know, all kinds of things. Don't do that. Worry about yourself and say, I will be an island of excellence. I'm not bothered about what is right and what is wrong. I will be right. I will do the right thing. And if all of us individually decide on that, then we can make several islands of excellence, which put together can make a continent of excellence. All right. Now I want to give you a little philosophical story. And this story is to do with what sometimes we call luck. There's an old man in a village. He's got horses. One night there's a storm and the barn door breaks and his horse runs away. The villagers come to the old man and say, very sad, very bad luck, your horse has run away. The old man says, it may not be so. The villagers are surprised. Two days later, the horse returns along with some more horses. So the villagers come and say, very good luck. You've got three horses instead of one. You are a very lucky man. The old man says, it may not be so. Next day, the old man's son is riding one of the wild horses who has come back and falls down and breaks his arm. So the villagers come and say, bad luck. Your son has broken his arm. The, the old man says, it may not be so. Next day, the king's men come. The kingdom is at war. All able-bodied young men are taken away. The boy is not taken because his arm is broken. So the villagers say, you're a very lucky man. Your son was not taken to the war. He says, it may not be so. What am I trying to say? We don't know what is good or bad for us. There is nothing good or bad. Everything just is. How you approach it, how you tackle it, determines your responses to the situation are more important than the situation itself. Don't worry about good luck and bad luck. You know, there is a saying, Strike when the iron is hot. Strike when the iron is hot. Good thing. But why wait for the iron to be hot? Pick up a hammer. Hammer it. Make the iron hot and then strike again. Create your own luck. Create your own destiny. Very important thing in life is to never give up. Once you've identified your goal, you will not give up. It's only the person who gives up who loses. Let me tell you a story. Winston Churchill, great orator, prime minister of uh, England during the Second World War, was called by his school to give an address to the students. So Winston Churchill sitting on the stage and the principal is saying, today we are honored to have with us uh, Winston Churchill and blah, blah, and he will speak to us. So the entire audience is very uh, wrapped with attention, want to listen to Winston Churchill. Churchill gets up, goes to the lecture stand, looks at the audience and says, never, 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 never. He says never five times. Never give up. And he sits down. That was his speech. That is all that he wanted to tell the students. Har manni nahi hai. Not going to give up. Another story. For this story, I'll take you to frog land. There are many frogs. There is a tree. And one silly frog says, let's have a competition. Which frog can climb up this tree? So some frogs who are sitting on the side say, are you silly? Frogs don't climb trees. Anyway, three or four youngster frogs say, we'll try, we'll try, we'll try. 
and the other frogs are saying give it up forget it you can't do it frogs have never climbed trees only monkeys climb trees some frogs jump up some go up one foot some go up two feet fall down give up and everybody is the spectators are saying boo you can't do it impossible ho nahi sakta one frog carries on and on and on and on and he climbs up so after that the tv reporter comes with the mic and says mr frog you climbed up the tree what are your views how did you do it and he says ha hey. uh, so it has been you muted i'm sorry be deaf to the naysayers when you are attempting something there will be a lot of people say beta ye koshish mat karo ye na mumkin hai ye ho nahi sakta don't listen to them listen to your voice listen to your mind carry on doing what you're doing right okay one or two more things i want to say i am running short of time i think foresight in life is more important than anything else i made this point earlier you must anticipate the trouble with us is that we see a problem right this is something difficult but because it's a problem we don't want to tackle it and we say i'll do the easy things first i'll do that later and we keep putting it off and then finally when the time comes to tackle that problem you realize that it is too late and you realize that if you had tackled that problem in time you could have solved it very easily i am telling you this has been the biggest lesson i have learned in my life that if you identify the problem and tackle it at the right time it is easy but if you keep postponing it because it is a bitter pill that you don't want to swallow then you will be confronted with a situation where you will not be able to solve the problem where the problem will overwhelm you so please anticipate i must tell you uh, i told you that um, i've been fond of reading so i must tell you who's my favorite military author and why because i think that has a lesson for life my favorite uh, military author is a gentleman called field marshal bill slim he's written a very authoritative book called defeat into victory he's written several other books and one of the most delightful books he's written is a book called unofficial history why do i like slim i like slim because whenever in war he was confronted with a situation where he failed he takes the blame upon his own shoulders he does not blame his subordinates and wherever in war he experienced success he does not take any credit for it he gives the credit to his subordinates i think that is the epitome of leadership spread the goodwill to the subordinates take all the blame on your own shoulders that is a good man you know the peculiar thing about a career in the armed forces is that you have to be a good human being you can be anything else in any profession and be good at it but you may not be a good human being but in this profession of soldiering because you are commanding troops you have to first be a good human being and only then can you be a good commander being a good human being is very important i think the problem in life is that we look at a person's success only from one parameter what is that parameter how high in that pyramid did that man rise that is an important a factor no doubt but it is not the only factor there are other measures of success family life your wife your children their children how are they doing in life your friends your subordinates your peers do they interact with you when you don't matter 
what have you been in life have you been a good human being or just a career soldier i think those factors are intangibles but they matter more in the long run that's really all that i wanted to say to you today uh, in closing i just want to make one or two remarks firstly define the purpose of your life i was asked this question once what should be purpose what should be the purpose of life think about it and the answer given by the person was the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose zindagi ka maqsad hai ki zindagi ko maqsad wali zindagi banana have a goal in life have a purpose in life a calling pukar andruni pukar this is what i want to do that is it work towards it you love it you know there's another saying if you love the work you do if you love the work you do you don't have to work a single day all your life have i worked in the army no i've enjoyed life in the army every day so love the work that you do if you don't love the work you do don't do it do something else find your calling find your purpose in life and follow it earlier during the introduction we were told about seeing and believing there's a simple thing see it believe it achieve it see what you want to be believe that you can achieve that you will definitely achieve it that's all i wanted to say to you i think i've rambled on and on i was given one hour and i think i've taken you know, almost exactly one hour so i feel happy about that i hope uh, that some of what i've said may inspire some of you in your own ways i wish you the very best in whatever field of life that you choose for yourself and um, i am more than confident that with the efforts that icsi is making it will be grooming youngsters for a great and glorious india we are a great country we are based upon values which are amazing secularism is our creed believe in it this country can go to great heights with the youth you are the future we are the past god bless you all jai hind good luck thank you sir uh, thank you this for this valuable session and indeed this session is really inspiring for all of us uh, listening to your uh, exemplary life story and the way uh, you have presented it and what each and every word that you have uh, told us it is it has come from your heart and it has gone into our heart deep down sir and thanks for that if you allow me i would like to ask few questions from you okay uh, uh, yes sir uh, we'll not take much more uh, of your time but i want to ask that thing and i uh, uh, i'm saying this from the core of my heart sir whatever you have told today na it will be with us lifelong thank and you. thank you so much for uh, for uh, uh, telling us all these things it is really inspirational each and every word i will say thank so you I very much to, uh, yes sir so i would like to ask that when i when i see uh, today's youth and today's youngsters um and and uh, those uh, uh, those who have got, uh, got their upbringing in the civil general family and those who have got the upbringing in the uh, army background family there's a lot many difference in their thought process in their actions in their vision focus why is this so what what is what is so different in the upbringing of being into an army family that makes a person what a person should be which we are seeing lacking in today's youth in general okay i i think that's a very very interesting and very appropriate uh, question uh, actually um, one word is the answer 
the answer to this is one word what differentiates one from the other is just one word and that is discipline Discipline. Where you have discipline in life, you can achieve anything. You go to any military cantonment, anywhere. Everything is laid out. Men walking in a disciplined manner, dressed in a disciplined manner. Things move with clockwork precision. Eight o'clock means eight o'clock. It doesn't mean five minutes past it. It doesn't mean five minutes to eight. Discipline is the key in society. You know, you take uh, a small city-state called Singapore. This was nothing 40, 50 years ago. It's a marshland. And a very great prime minister there, Lee Kuan Yew, he built up Singapore. How did he do it? Through discipline. Where you have discipline in society, you will achieve anything. And I would like to believe that in army families and military families, perhaps more of this discipline rubs off. And that is what differentiates, I think, a lot of army children from a lot of civilian children. Having said that, I want to tell you that in my 11 years in AFPI, I've come across the youth of Punjab. They are very good. Believe me, the youth is very good. And I'm saying for Punjab only because I been dealing with these boys, but that is the universal truth all over the country. What is missing is to channelize their energies in the right direction. If you channelize the energies of youth in the right direction, the youth can achieve anything. And if you don't channelize their energies in the right direction, they'll take to alcohol, they'll take to drugs, They'll take to decoity, they will take to eve teasing, they will take to everything that is wrong. Canalizing mm -hmm. the energy of the youth at the appropriate time through discipline is the key to success. Right. Uh, another question, sir. Um, yes. Uh, we have seen uh, there are a lot many change in uh, in technology from um, the previous years till, uh, till date. And that has also impacted the functioning of army as well. So being from the army background, what is your opinion that how technology has impacted army functioning and um, now more developments, more uh, 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 latest kinds of uh, uh, things to work on? Uh, what is your opinion on to that? Technology is a very, very major factor in warfare. And um, technology is changing very rapidly. The army in which I joined to what the army is today, a lot of difference. When I joined uh, my regiment in 1971, we had tanks which had no night fighting capability. We didn't have laser range finders. There was no such thing as drones, attack helicopters. Things have changed so rapidly. And I think things are changing so much faster now. You see, change is inevitable. And change in warfare has taken place all along. But what is significant today is that the rate of change has accelerated. And it is changing so fast that if a young officer does not keep pace with technology, he is hopelessly outdated. Now, just having modern technology by itself is not enough. You have to see how technology is going to be adapted and how your tactics and strategy will change keeping that technology in mind. This, what I've explained, is what is referred to as the revolution in military affairs. To keep pace with change, anticipate change, maybe even decide the direction of change, and then change the nature of warfare. So I think technology has impacted every aspect of life. The old days when soldiers were considered simple boopsings who knew nothing, couldn't sign their name, are over. Every soldier today has to be a 
competent professional man officers have to be competent professional leaders huge challenges we see now <clears throat> there was a conflict between armenia and azerbaijan a few last year where technology came in in big way the ukraine war uh, technology is impacting in a big way and a um, lot of things are changing we have to keep pace now there's a problem the problem is technology costs money and uh, for a for a country which is not so well off economically it's expensive to maintain such large forces so you have to decide on bread and butter but uh, yes technology is changing very rapidly yes thank you sir and one last question for this webinar for today um though you have given us so many inspirational story and everything and we even i have put it down in my notebook and that will be secured with me uh, forever um uh, but i want to ask that uh, whenever you get into your down moments many times what is the one motivational force behind you that always have told you no you have to do it so what is your inspiration your motivation well prayer prayer is important faith when i say prayer i i don't i mean you can believe in any god all gods are the same all religions are the same every man must have an anchor in life and one wonderful anchor in our lives is god and when you go through downs you have to put down that anchor and rely on that anchor seeing you through that storm i believe a lot in the power of prayer and um, i think it's a very personal thing prayer is always a very personal thing and prayer is not something to be made public but in our own ways uh, we as indians are very devout people and i think uh, prayer should be the anchor god should be your anchor god should be your faith thank you sir and um, people uh, like you are there in our military and our defense uh, uh, forces that's why i think uh, i believe we believe that our country is in the safer hands thank you so much sir for sharing your life experiences with us and it is really a remarkable experience for us today and we once again want to thank you for coming on our platform thank you very much good day